And we welcome you to this event because uh, as a part of our 25th anniversary, um, we are celebrating Black Lives in Archives. And so for our second event of our, our speaker series, we have Dr. Lisa Bratton, who is a professor of history at Tuskegee University. Uh, Dr. Bratton is a 2017-2018 recipient of our John O. Franklin Research Center travel grant and visited the Rubenstein Library to research in our archives. Uh, the title for our talk today will be Finding Gold About Green, Discoveries About Green Brighton uh, of Historic Brightonsville. Um, and uh, Dr. Brighton is a graduate of Howard University, Atlanta University, and Temple University. And as a historian, she has been a part of the Tuskegee Airmen Oral History Project, where she has interviewed over 250 airmen. Uh, her primary research interest is Historic Brightonsville, uh, the South Carolina plantation on which her ancestors Green and Melinda Brighton were enslaved. And we look forward to her talk today, and I am going to turn it over to her. But before I do that, really quickly, if you have questions at any point during uh, the event, I would ask that you use the Q&A function of our, our webinar format here to drop in questions, and I'll be monitoring the Q&A. Well, Dr. Brandon is going to take about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have questions at the end of 15 minutes or so uh, for questions. So without further ado, Dr. Lisa Brandon. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. It's an honor for me to be here. And I just want to thank everyone for coming and supporting and, um, and being a part of this day for me. So I really appreciate your time, everybody. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen in just a second, and I'm going to begin uh, my PowerPoint. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Uh, no, Lisa, I'm, I'm just seeing no. okay. yeah, your face. All right, give me one more second. Yep, I can see it now. Okay, perfect. And if you want to turn your camera on, you can. Or... I'm sorry. I was saying that it's totally up to you if you want to leave your camera off or on. Oh, okay. I can turn it on. Okay. All right. Um, this, uh, thank you again, John, for this opportunity. This was um, really a, an amazing opportunity for me. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. So this travel grant, as John mentioned, was to the John Hope Franklin Research Center at the Rubenstein Library at Duke. And at this um, library, I was very happy to see that they had a collection of the Bratton family papers from 1852 to 1839. And then also um, the Samuel Rainey papers, who was a Bratton family, a white Bratton family member from 1836 to 1851. So um, this, uh, I was very happy to be affiliated with any um, project or any, um, any project that was tied to the name of John Hope Franklin. Um, John Hope Franklin, a noted historian, if you, in case you've never heard his name before, um, the author of From Slavery to Freedom and many other works on African-American history. Um, and um, he spoke at the Auburn Avenue Research Library in Atlanta, where I live, in 2004. And I was able to get a copy of my book signed. So you can see my copy of From Slavery to Freedom. It's very old. It's very beat up. But that's a sign of a good book if it's beat up. Because um, I use it an awful lot. And in fact, I've used um, uh, more current ed editions of the book as a textbook in my classes on African-American history at um, Tuskegee University. So this is my favorite John Hope Franklin story. And um, this is just a, not an actual picture of, 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 uh, of the North Carolina archive where he studied, but um, this is what it probably looked like when he was there 
in the 1940s and 50s. So this is a story he told at the Auburn Avenue Research Library when I saw him in 2004. And I can't tell it as good as he did, but I will, I will try. So um, he wanted to do research at the State Archive in Raleigh, North Carolina. So he went to see the director and the director said, well, when we built this building, we didn't think that any Negroes would ever be interested enough to come here to do research. So we don't have any place for you to work. So I guess you're entitled to be here, but we'll have to make you some space. So give me a week. So Dr. Franklin had traveled from out of town and he started, you know, in his mind calculating his money and how much he's gonna have to pay for a hotel for a whole week while he sits and waits for them to find a segregated work area for him. So he told them, I'll be back in three days. And that was on a Monday. So he came back to the library on Thursday and they had him this little room across from the big research area that probably looks something like this. And they gave him a key to the stacks because they said, well, none of the uh, white pages are gonna wanna go and get your books for you, which is the way it works in an archive. So they gave him a key and a, and a, a book cart. and said, well, you'll have to go and get your own books. So in order for where, where his room was positioned, he had to walk through this reading room of these white researchers to get his books and then go back to his little closet area and back and forth. So he did that for about two weeks. And after about two weeks, the director came to him and said, we're going to have to take your key from you. So he's thinking, well, what did I do? Why are they taking my key from me? And he said, uh, so the director told him, that it turns out that the white people saw him going back and forth to the stacks and they decide that they want keys to the archive too. They wanna to be able to go and get their own books just like he was because they're being discriminated against. So that's my favorite John Hope Franklin story. So when I got to the archive, um, I opened up one of the ledgers. The ledgers, um, this particular ledger was about 400 pages. I open it up to the very first page, and what do I see? Green Bratton 194. In other words, page 194. So someone, I have no idea who it was, has written uh, had written um, citations or notations where they could find these particular people. Now, I know the names of Harriet Bratton, JSB, that's John Simpson Bratton, and others. I know those names, and they are all white names. Green Bratton, however, was uh, an African-American person. So I don't know who was doing this research, but I was just so elated. Wow, somebody's really looking out for me because no, otherwise I would have had to go through four over 450 pages of this ledger. And then I would have gotten to Green Bratton on 194. I, you know, as a researcher, you know, I went through the other pages anyway, but this just kind of gave me a jump start. So when I turned to page 194, this is what I found. Uh, it says Green Bratton, his name at the top, and this is a, a store record. So I'm going to show you some more pictures of Brattonsville, but they also had a store. And um, so I found those records super helpful because just imagine if someone had a list of all the products and services that you bought for an entire year, that would tell a whole lot about you. If I was a researcher, I'd be able to tell a lot about you by seeing what you bought for a year. So that's, um, uh, so this was super helpful to me. Um, and then you'll notice on the bottom, we're gonna get back to this name, but it says Elijah, the very, very bottom, the last entry, Elijah. So remember that name, we're gonna come back to that name, um, Elijah $29. It doesn't say what it's for. Um, apparently, um, I don't, I'm not sure what it's for, but we'll come back to that name. So, this is the this is the <laughs> the email that I sent John Gartrell after I found um, the the 430 page ledger. I sent him this email right away because I was so excited. And if you are a researcher and if you spend any amount of time in archives, you know how lonely it can be sometimes. And you just want to run up to any stranger on the street and tell them what you found. So I said, "Oh, I got to tell John about this." So. Um, to me, it was gold, and it was gold that came so easily because somebody had written Green Bratton's name on the front to help me out. Thank you, person, whoever you were. 
So this is my lineage. Um, Green and Melinda Bratton, who were enslaved at historic Brattonsville, and their son, William, who married Emma Bratton, and their son, Walter Green, who married Mary Williamson Bratton, and then my parents, John Walter and Mamie Jones Bratton, and then there's me. Uh, Mary Williamson is the um, descendant of a nearby plantation, uh, the Williamson Plantation, which is very close to Brattonsville. And um, Brattonsville, by the way, is in York County, South Carolina, which is just pretty much across the line from Charlotte. So it's very close to Charlotte, North Carolina, but it's actually in South Carolina. So this is Green Bratton. And um, not sure of what year he was born. I, you know, depending on what records I find, uh, the his age varies uh, as early as 1825 and as late as 1835. We're just not sure um, because, as you know, uh, enslaved people were not issued birth certificates. In fact, South Carolina didn't start issuing birth certificates until uh, around 1917 or 18 for blacks or whites. Um, and we know I uh, was able to find out that he died around 1917, which is the year my father was born. So, um, but, uh, and we know that from some testimony, um, some written testimony um, that had to do with the land. And um, so we know he died around uh, the start of World War I, but we're not sure exactly of the date. South Carolina didn't issue uh, death certificates to anyone uh, in 1917. Um, the best we can do when we're doing genealogy research um, uh, for births and deaths is to find a, a family Bible. And a lot of times people put all their information in a family Bible, but we don't, unfortunately, um, if there was a family Bible that has not uh, survived. So take a look at this shirt. It's a very beautiful shirt, I think. So remember this shirt, got a lot of mem mem uh, memorization to do. So you got to remember the name Elijah and you have to remember this shirt because we're going to come back to that. So um, Historic Brattonsville is the only working plantation in the state of South Carolina. So what does that mean? It means that on the plantation, um, we don't use any um, uh, equipment, et cetera, that wasn't available around 1850. And the farming, we do farming there and they raise animals and they use techniques that were available in 1850. Um, and so here's just some of the scenes of what happens at Historic Bradensville. It's open 363 days a year. We're back, now back open to uh, receive visitors. And, um, you, and every day that you're there, there are people dressed in period clothing that tell you the story of historic Brattonsville and what life was like for whites and what life was like for enslaved people as well. So I wanted to bring uh, attention to this picture. And so, and I want to, to um, uh, shatter, if you will, a myth about enslaved people. Now, if you watch movies like Django, 12 Years a Slave, um, you see people, um, you know, white people who are very wealthy in these huge, huge plantations with hundreds and hundreds of enslaved people that they're keeping in bondage. And then you see um, uh, that's that's kind of the, the, the picture that you get. But that is a very erroneous picture. Now, when you look about look at historic Brattonsville, the Brattons were wealthy, but they were. One, about 1% 1 of the population. So this is what um, the, the reality of people who were enslaved. You see that 75% of uh, whites did not own any enslaved people at all. Enslavement was a business, a horrible, terroristic, traumatic business. But for people who were in that business, it was very lucrative for them, um, but also quite expensive. And so you see um, holding 50 or more people in bondage, that was a very small percentage of the population. So we want to get rid of this notion that all the, um, the, the whites in the South were rich. And um, if they did own an enslaved person or keep a, per a person or persons in bondage, they held one or two, and they were right alongside them in the field working as well. We just want to get rid of that myth. So... This is uh, basically what Bradensville looked like when I came. The first time I went to Bradensville, I was a child. I don't know, maybe I was about six. 
And the buildings were there, but it was not yet a historic site. So it was just, um, there was a sign. I remember the sign, um, but that's all that was there. And there was no staff. There was no um, historic designation. Um, that was it. But I grew up in Vallejo, California, and there was no, we never saw our name on any, except unless it related to the five of us in my family, I never saw the name Bratton anywhere. So when I saw Brattonsville for the first time, this is what I thought, that we used to be rich. Because I knew that the buildings were old. I knew that they were not new buildings, but I said, wow, this is great, yay. We used to be rich, this is amazing, this is fantastic. And so, but, um, and I don't know, I don't remember telling anyone about that. I just, it was just my little six-year-old thought. So when I got older, um, maybe in uh, older elementary school, let's say, I thought that everybody had a Brattonsville. I thought that if you drive around in the South long enough, you will see your plantation. And so I didn't think Brattonsville really was that big of a deal because I figured everybody knew where their plantation was. But now I know that not to be a fact. So this is another of my libraries. This is um, the South Carolina Library in Columbia. It's on the campus of the University of South Carolina. And it's the home of the Bratton Family Papers. So this is probably one of my favorite places in the world um, because of the Bratton Family Papers. And um, I found out from the archivist that the Bratton Family Papers are the largest collection of private papers that the library has. And so after going there so many times, it took me several visits to go through all of the papers um, at the library. And I got, you know, you get to know the archivist. And um, so, and you know, you're never supposed to go in the back where they keep all the records. They bring them out to you as needed and take them back when you're finished. So I said, I need to see, can I please see how big the collection is? I see, see it all. Oh, well, you know, we're not supposed to do that, la, la, la. But he let me back there anyway. Um, um, hold on, I'm sorry. So he let me back there anyway, and I was able to see how um, basically pretty massive the collection is. And um, I will just say this to the... Um, how did the paper survive? So um, the Brat it took a while, it took years and years and years, decades for the Brattons to settle the estate after it had been um, in operation as a kind of a center of the little town, McConnell's. Um, and so in the, in, it just took them a long time to settle the estate. And so the buildings just sat and sat and sat. And the papers were somewhere probably in an attic and they sat as well. But when they found the paper, someone, thank you to whoever that was, had the good sense to say these records are valuable and donated them to the uh, University of South Carolina. And now they're available for all researchers to see. So I contend that the Brattons saved everything. So why, how, why do I say that? Because they have a receipt written on the back of a corn shock. And it's in the Bratton family papers in South Carolina. So I contend that if you save a receipt written on the back of a corn shop, you have saved everything else. So this is the will of, and I, I have this typed out, so I just wanted you to see the original document. So this is the will of Francis Irwin, and this is the first document that I was able to find about Green Bratton. So it's a will, and it says, um, I will and bequeath to my son Francis my house and lot in Yorkville, my Negro boy Green, and my Negro woman Melinda and her child Fanny, um, and any other children she may have um, previously to my death, previously to my death, to him and his heirs forever. The first time I saw this, I was so triggered, is the best word maybe, by this word forever. Because when you say her children forever, that's me. And so, it, I don't know, it kind of took me to a different place and it's really hard to describe, but that word, has um, it was a trigger for me because as you know, um, 
people who held slaves didn't expect enslavement to ever end. And so um, this was supposed to be a situation forever. Not. Um, and so the, oh, I meant to put a big X by this because now I wanna talk about after enslavement. And um, we know that, um, well, some people may or may not know that we were not freed by the Emancipation Proclamation, which was issued in 1863. We were freed by the, oh, that's why it just disappeared. No to the Emancipation Proclamation. We were freed by the 13th Amendment. And that says that neither slavery nor uh, involuntary solitude, uh, servitude is um, legal or constitutional in the United States. And this part people are dealing with still, except for uh, punishment of a crime. But um, so now if anyone ever says to you that we were freed by the um, Emancipation Proclamation, you can correct them and tell them no, it was the 13th Amendment. So after enslavement was over, um, Green Bratton and others were faced with the decision now of what to do and where to go as free people. Green Bratton decided to stay on the plantation. And this is a copy of the first uh, sharecropping agreement that he signed. And right there, well, the arrow's a little off, but right there next to that, it says, uh, Friedman Green, his mark. And um, um, he wasn't able to learn to read and write. We think he did learn as an adult, but immediately after enslavement, he was not able to read and write, so he made his mark. And what I have found in several of the agreements and several of the documents where I see his name, he's always the first to sign. And I'm not, I, I'm not sure why that is. Maybe um, the white people felt, well, if Green Bratton signs and others will sign, or um, I'm just not sure, but I see often that he is the first person to sign. Um, I did find out also that Green Bratton was a, was a registered voter and he was um, uh, a member of a, a jury pool. So his name was selected to uh, among jurors to be, to sit in judgment of a white man accused of murder. His name was in the jury pool. He, he did not serve as a jury because you know they have the, op, uh, the lawyers have the option to strike people from the jury, but he was in the jury pool to sit in judgment of a white man. Um, this is the second sharecropping agreement that Green Bratton signed that was going to be um, valid for the year of 1867. But before I go on, let me go back to the first one. Um, the first one you just see kind of, it just says, very basic. It just says um, that uh, this is how we're going to split the crop. So um, how sharecropping is, works is that um, the freedmen were, uh, and whites who were sharecroppers as well, were given in advance maybe some seed, an animal, or whatever tools they needed to um, grow the crop. And then when the crop was harvested, there was the agreement was to split, let's say the beans 50-50 or split the corn 70-30, but it was all laid out in advance how the crop would be split. And then if there was so-called any money left, if we're owed you any money, then you would get cash at the end of the harvest season or when the crop was sold. So this sharecropping agreement basically just says, this is how we're gonna split the, um, this is what you'll do, this is what I'll do, and this is how we'll make the split at the end of the harvest. So this is the second sharecropping agreement. This is the third page of this sharecropping agreement. So the second year that individual, that uh, African-Americans were freed, the sharecropping agreement changed drastically. It says you cannot have a dog, your house is open for inspection at any time, you must be polite to John Simpson Bratton and his white family. Um, you can't have liquor. You can't leave the plantation without permission. You can't have firearms. I mean, it's very, very detailed. So one of the pieces of my research is to see what happened between these two years that, that caused such a drastic shift in the tone and in the content of these uh, sharecropping agreements. So um, I remember I mentioned earlier that the Brattons had a store. And so 
Um, a lot of the, some of the records were at the Rubenstein Library, and these records were at the Bratton Family Papers. And so it says that on September 24th, 1870, Green Bratton bought a pint of whiskey for mother. So before you say, oh, whiskey, whiskey, whiskey was used for medicinal purposes as well as just people drinking just to be drunk, whatever. So um, I always have to clarify that. So um, this is what he bought, one half pint uh, of whiskey for mother. So it's possible that their mother was on the plantation and she may have been an elderly person and that's why they chose not to leave the plantation. Not sure. And I wish they had just taken the 0 0.01 seconds that it would have taken to write the mother's name because that would have been helpful for me, but it's not there. So I don't know the mother's name and, and in all the records that I've found, I've never been able to find their mother's name. And then another document said um, a bottle of whiskey for Elijah. Remember, we're going to remember the name Elijah from before. So uh, October 19th, 1868, it, the store records show that they bought a bottle of whiskey for Elijah. Now, Elijah may have been Green's father, may have been Melinda's father, not sure. But that may have been another reason why they chose to stay on the plantation. But it's clear that Elijah is not their child because they're buying a bottle of whiskey for him. So Green and Melinda um, purchased land um, on which they were once enslaved. And for me, that is just a, I'm, I'm proud of them anyway, but just ultimately proud of them for purchasing land um, on the plantation um, on which they were once enslaved. And they were the first freedmen to purchase land in York County. Now there were some uh, African, some, some free, Negroes, or that's what generally what they're called. There were some free Negroes who lived in uh, York County um, that were free as early as 1824. And they were perhaps landowners, but um, Green and Melinda were the first freedmen to purchase land in York County. And all my life, my father told us that Green Bratton got the land from his white father. So you saw the picture of him. It's quite likely that his father was white. And so I believe that my whole life, um, because and my father shared that with me because that's what was shared with him. But I came across a document in the Bratton family papers that showed that Green was not given anything. He was, uh, he worked for this land. And um, so some of the jobs that he did, he, he uh, raised cotton, he hoed cotton, he built an arbor. Um, and there are other jobs that throughout the Bratton family papers, I can see that he did. And so what this document shows is that he was not given the land, he purchased the land. And um, John Simpson Bratton acted as his banker of sorts, paid him interest on the land, uh, on his money that he was saving. So the land was $10 an acre and he bought 10 acres. And um, it also says in another document um, on his first, oh, oh, it's this document. You can see it right here, I'll point, on his first 10 acres of land. But to my knowledge, there has not been a second purchase, um, but it just says first 10 acres right here. And then, um, let me see if I have it printed out. No, I don't. Um, at the bottom, it says um, that the balance is due on December 25th, but he actually paid off the balance on uh, December 12th. And that's where you see the, the blue star um, that he paid his, his loan off 13 days early. That's a badge of, of, of honor for me. I'm just, just proud of him. The land is still in our family today. Um, and it's, it's very important to me. It's the most important piece of real estate in the world for me. Um, and this shows uh, after, uh, in, um, after enslavement was over, Melinda Bratton worked in the house. She also um, worked in the field as well, but this is her, the document that shows that she was working in the house in 1881 and she's gonna make $40 a year. So I have to tell young people sometime, no, that's not $40 a day or $40 an hour, that's $40 a year. And so what this document shows is, um, and she's gonna get her money, she's not gonna get her money until, until December. And so the items that she purchased, purchases 
from the Bratton store are listed here. And so they start, she starts on February 1. So she's really not even gonna make the whole $40. And you see that these various items that she purchased and they keep track of that. And then at the end of the year, she gets the cash that's left over after the $40. So this is the bottom of that record that you just saw. And so um, it says order to NB. I'm not sure what order two is, but NB is Napoleon Bonaparte Bratton. Who was uh, who owned the store? So let's look at this. The numbers that just moved, absent for one day because she didn't come to work. One day on December the tenth, they docked her fifty cents. So, and you have a person making forty dollars a year. It seems like to me you wouldn't dock them fifty cents for being out of work for one day. And then uh, the numbers that just moved, they're turning colors. She broke the front door and damper of the stove on December the 10th. They docked her a dollar. Remember, $40 a year. And then also on December the 10th, she buys a gent shirt for a dollar fifty. I mean, that's so extravagant, right? But to me, if you are going to spend a dollar fifty for a shirt, you would probably take a picture in that shirt, your very expensive $1.50 shirt. So I believe that this is the shirt that Green, that uh, Melinda Bratton bought her son possibly for Christmas on December the 10th, 1881. You're invited. So every second Saturday in September, we have at Historic Brattonsville uh, an event called By the Sweat of Our Brow. And these are some scenes from By the Sweat of Our Brow. So in the top left, um, are the seven or uh, five of the seven sacred families. And these are families from the descendants groups that um, we help to, we help Bradsville plan events. We, um, they might be listening. So I said, we keep them in line <laughs> a little bit. And um, uh, when we have this event every second Saturday in September, the bottom left are two of the very active um, descendants um, in our group, Wally Cathcart and Margaret Parson who are also my cousins, and um, they're probably listening. So I thought they might like to see a beautiful picture of themselves. So at By the Sweat of Our Brow, every year I have the same complaint. And the complaint is that there's so much going on at the plantation that day that I don't get a chance to go to all of it. Sometimes I'm a speaker and that takes up time, which I'm happy to do it, but it just limits what I'm able to do. And so uh, a few years ago, we had a brick making um, demonstration and I was determined to make a brick um, because the Brattons built, uh, the Brattons made their own bricks. And sometimes people would see, we believe that the slave cabins were made of brick. And, um, you know, it, people might say, oh, well, the Brattons, wow, look how well they took care of their slaves. They have them in a brick cabin. Okay, no. Um, First of all, they made the bricks, so it was, it's probably cheaper for them to build the cabins out of brick. And um, if you put the, the, we believe that the cabins were along the main road. And so when people drove by, they would see these uh, brick cabins and say, wow, look how prosperous the Brattons are. But just let me be very clear that this was not about a love for Black people. It was not about a love. It was about prosperity and, and, the, and the look how it looked. So um, I did, was able to make my brick. You see my little beat up brick over there, but I'm very proud of it. Um, and I got a chance to see really what that was like. So why am I sleeping under a blanket in, in the dark down here at the bottom right? So um, several years, uh, maybe about four to five times, I have spent the night in a slave cabin the night before um, uh, by the sweat of our brow. So this got started, there is a, um, a historic preservationist by the name of Joseph McGill, who um, travels around the country, sleeping in places where enslaved people have slept um, in order to bring awareness to these places. And so he wanted to come to Brattonsville. The staff and management of Brattonsville said, well, you have to ask the descendants. 
And so the descendants, we agree that it would be a good idea. And I stayed there with him. And I see Prenny Anderson is on the call. She was there with us. And uh, there were four of us all together that spent the night in this cabin. And since then, I've taken some of my students to sleep there um, the night before. I think I've taken Tuskegee students on two different occasions. Um, and others have slept there as well. One night we slept in the big house because I've always heard for years that it was haunted and that uh, Martha Bratton didn't like black people. I've been hearing that story for decades. So we slept there one night, but she didn't show up. So um, this is uh, Forest Hall, also known as Hightower Hall. And um, on the, in the Bratton family papers, it indicates that on August 21st, uh, Green's wife is what it says, doesn't name her by name, but Green's wife was paid $1 for hoeing cotton at Hightower Hall. Fast forward to a few years ago, this is uh, Congressman John Spratt and me at Hightower Hall. So um, uh, Congressman Spratt is a descendant of, uh, descendant of Rufus Bratton, one of my biggest supporters. Um, and so, uh, you know, we go from one, one uh, year, um, Melinda Bratton is hoeing cotton. And then here it is a hundred years or so later that her descendant is hanging out. And we, we were like doing a supermodel pose or something I told him to do. Let's, let's be, I don't know what I said, but you know, he's kind of do what I'm doing. Um, but that, you know, a hundred years later, her descendant is hanging out with um, a congressman. Thank you very much. Um, this is, I wanted to share that last picture really because um, just to kind of give the, the irony of this is not lost on me. The importance of my work is not lost on me. I think it would be criminal for me to have a PhD in African-American history and not tell the story. Um, I owe it to my great, great grandparents who were not able to read and write. And since I'm given that luxury, then it's up to me to tell this story. Otherwise, I think I'm being disrespectful to them and I hope they're pleased with what I'm doing. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was that was great. Um, Thank you. It's great to see all the many familial connections that you've made. And I see we've already got a couple of questions in the Q&A box. If others have questions, please feel free to to drop them in and I'll, I'll go ahead and, and read the first one. Um, so from one of the anonymous attendees, uh, the question is, where's the first step in finding my father's history in Monroe, Louisiana? Um, as a genealogist, the first step is talking to anyone in your family who might have information and then um, uh, uh, recording them, even if you don't work with the recording right away, record them. And then um, Ancestry.com is one of my favorite um, websites that I use. It, um, it's usually available at any library. Most of the libraries will offer it for free. During COVID, my library has been offering it for free at home. Um, oftentimes you have to go into the library to use the free copy. But um, Ancestry.com and putting in the names that you know, and also attending genealogy events to learn more about specifics on how to do genealogy. That's where I'd start. Okay, uh, we had another sort of comment from Sylvia. She also had a question about how to start looking for her grandfather's history. So I think you gave us all some really good breadcrumbs there. Uh, she mentioned um, that you should consider writing a blueprint for all of the attendees here to develop a, a museum of our own family history and register it as a historical place. <laughs> Well, I have been working on this Green and Melinda book for so long. People probably have stopped asking me, when's your book going to be finished? But um, I am working on it in earnest now. I have a writing group that we meet every morning from 6 to 8 a.m. And then we meet every Saturday from 8 to 1. And I've been missing very few days with my writing group. And so this book may uh, be on the way to being reality, uh, but I I can't commit to any other writing project. This is one that I've been working on forever. Okay, uh, we have another question from Ori, who I know, she's a, a graduate fellow in the, the Franklin Research Center and a graduate student at North Carolina Central University. 
Uh, and she had a question. She would love to hear more about your experience sleeping on the land with your students. And how did you see the experience shifting their understanding of slavery and historic sites? Wow, that's a really good question. So the first time I did it, um, I had a very interesting experience. So we uh, we had a um, uh, we had a gentleman there who fixed dinner for us over an open fire, and it was meat, uh, some kind of a stew with meat in it. And I don't eat that. And I knew what the menu was beforehand. So I brought my own food, no problem. So what I have, I had a croissant and yogurt and, you know, <laughs> this kind of, and I said, you know, these, I don't know. I just felt real bougie and kind of out of place a little bit, but it was okay. And so um, now when it was time for us to go to the cabin to sleep, we got out of our, um, got our, all of our um, gear out of the car. So I've got what a flashlight on my phone. I've got, um, a chair that I like a nice lounge chair that I'm sleeping in. I got my blanket. And so uh, there are four of us trying to cross the street and you should have seen us watch out for the, wait a minute. No, is there a fence over there? No, we, can, we should go this way instead. No, the ground slopes down. Well, do you have this? I mean, and I'm just thinking I've got all of these resources and tools that I need to make my, evening comfortable, I've got a phone that I can call one of my cousins and say, you know what, I'm tired of this. I'm on my way to your house. I've got a MasterCard or, you know, a Visa. I've got um, a hotel that I can call and um, no one is looking for me. I'm not an enslaved person. So I have every single advantage. The four of us are just trying to get across the street and it's so difficult. And I'm thinking, what did people who have none of the advantages I have and who don't have the option to call their cousin and say, I'm tired of this, what were they dealing with? And we could barely the cost you. So that was the first lesson I learned. When my students came, um, one of them came uh, and brought her mother. And then the other one time it was two students. And um, they, this, when we slept in the big house, they were so nervous and scared, thinking that they were going to be ghosts and all of that. But um, I said, okay, you want to go to the cabin? No, we'll stay here. So, um, but they, they got, uh, they got out of it. I, I think they got something out of it. They were, um, um, I think this was an opportunity for them that they'll likely never have again. Um, and at night, um, I, almost every night that I'm there, I walk around at night is very quiet. And I just kind of try to feel what Green and Melinda felt. I welcomed them to come and talk to me or commune with me. They have not, but um, I don't know. I just kind of walk around and, and try to grasp the, 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 the heaviness of it and the, the reality of it at night when there's no one else there. So it's very peaceful to me. Uh, so the next question is from Siobhan. Uh, she says, Dr. Bratton, did your grandparents have stories and information about Brattonsville, or was it your father who told you about the story? Okay, good question. I didn't know my father's parents. They died, um, the uh, grandfather died in 43, my grandmother died in 54. So I didn't have a chance to meet either of them, but my father talked to me a lot about it. And when we would go down south, what's what we call it, we'd go down to the country, and I remember walking with him on the land, showing me the, the borders of the land that we owned and showing me, you know, um, showing me that there were um, like these orange ties on the tree. And I guess those were the markers, but he talked to me about the land a lot. And um, the picture that I showed you of Green Bratton was on my mantle the whole time I grew up. And so we'd ask my father, who was that? He would just kind of say, that's Green Bratton. Okay. He didn't, well, Green Bratton probably died uh, the year my father was born, so he doesn't remember him, but he did sometimes talk, uh, talk, give us stories about his growing up, et cetera. Some, my father was a talker, um, but um, yeah, he, he, yeah, he did. He did share some stories, but the, I think too that the, the ugly side of segregation and the ugly side of living in the South as Black people he didn't share much about that. And I guess he didn't want to 
make us feel, I don't know, I'm not sure why. And I think too, that was um, kind of the way it was for that generation of people growing up. They didn't want to remember all of that negative. They don't want to re, you know, relive that. And they definitely didn't want to tell their children. So um, some of the, uh, the stories that he told me were um, more, more along a happier line, I would say. Yeah. Mm. So I, I, I was curious as you were talking, you said you grew up in California, right? So how old were you when you first went down south? Um, I know I went as a baby, but I, that, that I could remember I was probably about six. Oh, the first time I saw Brattonsville, and that's when I thought we were rich. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I think just by my own personal experience, I grew up in Philadelphia in the north, and my family's from North Carolina. And so the experience of going down south is a, a common one, but it's interesting that there's almost like a sort of a reverse migration going on now where many African Americans who are from the west or from the Midwest or the north are now finding roots in the south. Um, so yeah, it's, it's super, very interesting. Um, yeah, we would, um, we went, sometimes we went at Christmas, sometimes we went in the summer, but uh, my parents are not touristy travelers, you know, like let's go here and go there to this site, and this historic site, but they did make sure that we knew our family because we were the only Brattons in Vallejo. We didn't have any other family members in the city. The closest family was about an hour away. And so we would um, make sure they would make sure that we went to North Carolina pretty often mm -hmm. to that we could make that connection. Otherwise, we wouldn't know anybody in our family. Mm -hmm. um, someone noted that a similar experience that, you know, ancestors often don't talk about, you know, the past as much. And it's, it's often sparked her and um, her desire to learn more about her family history. Uh, but there's another question from Kelsey who asked, what were some of the things that you found most helpful uh, from special collection librarians and archivists that helped you along in your research? Um, you mean help from the archivists themselves? Yes. yes. Um, I, um, they know the collections generally. They know because they work in them all day, every day. And um, I think that two, um, I'm, I'm trying to separate them now, the Rubenstein and the um, Brett and the uh, South Carolina Library. But I think it's been super helpful that they, um, that they know the collection. And I'm the researcher, I'll go through all of it. Even if they say, well, we don't think this is gonna be that helpful. I'm gonna go through it anyway, because I wanna be thorough and I want to see every single document, every page on the document. I want to see it all. Um, but one, I, I know they're not paid for this, but I know what helps me is um, if I, when I find a really interesting document, I go to them and say, look what I found. Look at this. I can't believe it. I think Green Bratton's mother was, uh, Melinda's mother was at, on the plantation. And they act thrilled with me. Wow, that's great. <laughs> But I know what they're probably thinking. I first of all, they're probably thinking I see this all day long, every day, all day. Okay, great. But um, it's you know they act helpful, they act interested, even if they're not. But um, I, I don't know. I just find them generally to be super helpful. And if they do, even if they don't know an answer, that their attitude is, I'll find out for you. I'm not sure. I'll find out for you. But um, people at uh, at archives, that's just, I, I guess that's part of the job description. You have to be super helpful um, there. And also um, at historic societies, it's the same. Um, these are people who work with these documents all day long and know, you know, probably are from the area and they can tell you a lot that you might not be able to find online. Can't, because you can't find it all online. So talking to a lot of people, um, is generally very helpful. So definitely a, a stark contrast from the story you shared of John Hope Franklin in the beginning, where um, at least we've seen a little bit of evolution of the door being, well, at least for him, the door was open, but it was closed, right? It was closed from the fact that he was doing research in a segregated South to now you're finding a lot more um, assistance from archivists. And I can, I remember the two of us when we met in the reading room um, which is actually my background here. And you were, you told me like, oh yeah, I found, you know, I found this person and you were really excited. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a front from my end to, to share in your excitement. I think 
um, if if we can help somebody as the, the, the hymn goes, uh, we're always happy to do that, so. Yes, thank you. And I, I know I can be, you know, um, I don't know. I just, I do. I kind of get over the top with it because I'm just so excited. Then I'm calling people on the phone. Guess what I found? Guess what I found? So it is really exciting. But I did want to, before you go to the next question, and while other people are, and, and you know, I just want to say that there's no question that um, there's a, what did I say, a dumb question. I haven't heard a dumb question yet. So if you want to know, please do ask. Um, I do want to share this story my father told me about. So he um, didn't go very far in school. My father's probably the wisest person I ever met, but he didn't go very far in school. He did attend a Rosenwald school, um, which is schools that um, Julius Rosenwald, the chairperson of Sears, helped to build all over the South. And he did go to one of the Rosenwald schools. But he said when um, he was a, a young child, very young, that sometimes the white kids bus if the white kids bus got stuck in the mud, they would have the black children help push the um, bus out of the mud. And so he's too young to know that this was uh, the, 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 the importance of this task, but he thought it was, you know, he felt an honor. You know, he said, he said, well, I thought that was an honor to help push their bus out of the mud, um, not really realizing the, the rest of the, the, the story. It, like I said, he was very young. But that was probably um, one of the one of the worst, I guess, the most troubling uh, stories that he ever told me about. Um, but he did go some in school. But, um, you know, 1917, it just wasn't, it, you know, in the cards for a lot of black people to get a lot of education. Yeah. Uh, so Simmons asks, uh, how did you feel visiting Brattonsville as an adult versus your childhood experience? Um, that's a good question. I, I, I think if I had visited it for the first time as an adult, it would have been very different, but I've always known about it since, since I was very young. And, um, when I go there now, it's, uh, it's still never just a, a routine visit for me. So it's, it's, even though I may, um, you know, go about doing what I'm supposed to do and having a meeting there or giving a, uh, uh, showing my family around during the uh, family reunion, et cetera, but it's always in my head how big of a deal this is. I don't know a single person who can go back to their exact plantation. I don't know one single person I've ever known. So I know it's very unique. That's not lost on me. Um, and every time I'm there, I'm thinking about, wow, I wonder if Green walked this exact, if he was in this exact spot, him or Melinda were standing in this exact spot, what was going on in their head? How were they feeling? Did they ever think that maybe one day their great, great grandchild might be involved in this story? Did they even have a clue that Lisa Bratton was even possible? I think I'm, uh, an example of their wildest dream, seeing that t-shirt maybe, I am my ancestor's wildest dream. And I think those of us who are doing this work or those of us who are just trying to be successful in this life and taking advantages of the opportunities that we have that they didn't have, I'm wondering if they are even, if that was even on their mind, I wonder. So my imagination is cranked up so much when I'm at Bradsville. Um, when I, you know, walk in the cabin or when I walk into the big house or when I go in the, uh, when I, when I see the cotton gin, cause I know that Green Bratton gin cotton, Brattonsville has a working operating cotton gin. Mm -hmm. And I love going, if they don't have it on cranking up when, uh, by the sweat of our brow, I would go find the man um, and ask him, can you please turn on the cotton gin for me? And they always do it. But that is part of this communion that I have with them constantly, um, just, just thinking about them. But I think had I gone there for the first time as an adult, I don't know. I, I, I would have still had the same love for it, but it, it, I think it would have been very different. It just would have been different. Yeah, um, here in Durham, we have a, uh, a plantation. It's the largest plantation in the state called Stagsville. And they've made a, a, a lot of connections with descendants of enslaved people and similar to Brattonsville, they also have sort of like a reunion every year 
Um, and kind of along those lines, I was wondering how, um, so it's the, the only operational plantation in the state of South Carolina. And we know that, um, especially after the year that we had last year, that we're trying to find different ways to interpret the history of these historically white Eurocentric places. And so I wonder what was, I don't know if it was a fight, if it was a conversation, how did sort of the black descendants become integrated into the celebration of that place? And what was, what were those conversations like with, I'm sure it was probably, it's a state run thing. So, you know, states like to tell a very sanitized history, especially South Carolina or most states in the South, uh, sanitized history of plantations or farms where enslaved people lived. So what was it like as a descendant? And it seems like you have a collective of descendants of that place who are advocates for that story. Okay, yes, yeah, so that's a great question. It didn't, it wasn't always this way. Um, in the beginning, we would get, my family and I would get um, invitations to Brattonsville. This is in the 70s, maybe in the 80s. Invitations to Brattonsville to come and learn about the architecture or come and learn about how wonderful Colonel John Bratton was. And we never went to any of that. It didn't speak to us. And it doesn't, so we never went. If I went, I would just go and take some of my little cousins maybe and show them Brattonsville and we walk around, get in the car and go back home. But we never went to any of those events. Um, so in, two, in 2003, we got um, an invitation for the black descendants to meet with the white descendants. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I'm going to this. So I called everybody in Atlanta and in Rock Hill and the surrounding area, because I wasn't going by myself. And I didn't know what to expect. This before I had talked to anybody at Bradsville. And um, I said, okay, we're gonna go down. And so we go down and um, it's very kind of sterilized. It's like, pass the salt. Oh, it's a beautiful day out here. Nobody is talking about the elephant in the room. Your family enslaved my family. But what the information said also was to bring your pictures and bring your, uh, if you have documents or pictures, bring that. So before I left here, I got my ancestors down from the wall, put them in a big bag, take them to Bradensville. So at the event, um, and Congressman Spratt was there, it's the first time I met him. So at the event, they said, okay, they talked and said what they were gonna say. And they said, all right, well, we're about to conclude now. I said, excuse me, um, the invitation said, bring your, pictures. So I brought my pictures. I want to show my pictures. So I'm bringing my pictures out and people are so crowded around me. They are wanting to know more. And um, there was a, a white man there who I've since I've interviewed him, John Bratton, found out later he had said he'd always said he didn't understand why black people had to come to these events. But he saw that I, you know, bringing my proof and showing him Green Bratton, et cetera. He said, oh, now I understand why. Um, but the, so the, so the, so now, fast forward, Brattonsville now um, welcomes the telling of the true story. There was a, a um, uh, Rufus Bratton was one of the main members of the Ku Klux Klan in South Carolina and was responsible for lynching a man. He, uh, Rufus escaped to Canada. The federal marshals from the U.S. went to Canada and brought him back to mm -hmm. trial. And when you went to Bradensville years ago, you couldn't even say the name Rufus. They said, oh yeah, let me uh, pull you over here to the side and then I'll discuss that with you. Um, but let's just hold that question for later. It was that, but now, um, you know, we tell the story of Rufus and it's okay to say that. So um, also we are planning a three part series for, it's gonna be, um, uh, it's not gonna be for the public, uh, not yet, but um, of the white Bradens, the white descendants talking to the black descendant. Let's have a conversation about this. And so we're working now uh, to work on the details, et cetera, but I want to start that conversation and um, just to, to um, just let's, uh, let's talk about it. So we're, we're moving toward that. Wow, that's, that's, that's amazing. I mean, um, the, I guess the, the thing that as you were saying all of that, you know, it's not just that, um, you know, these black people are here is that y'all are related. Like, it's not, it's not just you, you know, your descendants live there. You, you all are familially related. And how much so, of the conversation is, is, is on that level? 
Well, um, I've had DNA. I asked Congressman Spratt for probably, I don't know how long I bugged him, probably eight years to take a DNA test with me. And he, you know, no, said he wanted to do it, but other family members didn't want us, et cetera, et cetera. So long story short, he's taken the DNA test and his daughter, she might be on the call too. His daughter's taking the DNA test. His daughter and I share no DNA. Hmm. So it's been, you know, my family, uh, some members of my family, it seemed to me that they wanted so badly to be related to the White Grattans. I didn't care if I was related to them or not. I just wanted to know whether hmm. I was on happy about it. I'm not disgusted by it. It's just kind of is what it is. But it turns out that there is no blood relation between us. Now, I do have a cousin by marriage. She's on the call. She's related to um, the White Brattons. Um, I am not. Um, so Green Bratton's father, I don't know uh, who his father was, but it wasn't one of the White Brattons. So we have uh, one more question in the chat. Uh, this is kind of a big one. Uh, what is your take on reparations, given you know all the connections that you have with this space and how you can actually date your family back to the time of enslavement? Uh, so Dorothy asks, what is your take on reparations? Oh, that is a big question. Um, while reparations can never take back the centuries of what enslavement has done to our family, to done to all Black people. Um, there, there does need to be some form of financial compensation. And why do I say that? Green Bratton and Melinda Bratton were denied so many opportunities to be their best selves. And I know maybe Green Bratton might have made an excellent politician. Maybe he was a great singer. Maybe he was a would have been a great writer. We will never know this because the United States government said, "You, you, you, you we'll, we're denying this from for, for you. We're not going to allow you to go to school. We're going to force you into a state of enslavement, and you will stay there for your entire natural life." And uh, because of him being limited, that means my great grandfather was limited which means my father was limited and grandfather and father were limited. Um, and so they will never be able to repay that. However, um, there should be some kind of a, of compensation to us who have struggled to make this country rich. Um, Brattonsville needs to, and I know some of them were on the call, um, Brattonsville needs to atone that they've made some, some strides toward doing that. Um, in terms of how they're telling the story. I think that's part of it. Um, but they're, they're, I, and, and I guess the hard part of this for me to answer that is when is it enough? Because you'll never be able to repay this debt ever. Right. But when is it enough? And um, I guess it was in the 70s when they, uh, the government enacted affirmative action po uh, policies. That was supposed to be our reparations. Okay, no. Um, the, until I think until the government even acknowledges, when are they going to acknowledge the 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 sacrifices and the, the um, that we made in this country, having built this nation? That's not even they're they're still not even at the acknowledgement point, and so um, there does need to be some kind of compensation. Um, and not just for those of us who can trace back to a plantation, because most people can't do that. But um, I, I'm, I'm most definitely in favor of it. The logistics is just what I'm not quite um, uh, convinced about. Okay. If I could ask one more question, and I want to circle back to your students um, at Tuskegee. So how are you integrating this history in your classes um, in terms of whether it's assignments or research for your students at the undergraduate level. Um, so how, how are you integrating this into to your classes? Um, some years, I've been in Tuskegee 11 years. Some years I have them uh, focus on Historic Brattons. We kind of use it as a case study. Some years I just only talk about it and show them uh, pictures of it, especially now since we're on Zoom. Um, 
So it, it varies, but the years that I have them focused on it, I have them use some of the original documents. Historic Bradensville, I, I don't know how many original documents I have. I don't know, 300, I never counted them. But there's a lot. And so I asked the students, what is it about enslavement that you wanna learn about? If they say women, got a document for you. If they say um, uh, uh, sharecropping, I got a document for you. So I had them some years, I have them focus on primary research that I have copies of and they um, and then they work with that. Those are those are the best years. Those are my most fun years. I should do that next semester. I think I will <laughs> go back to letting them use some of the primary sources. Love primary sources in the classroom. Uh, so Dr. Brighton, thank you so much for sharing. It's over. With us. No. Yes, yes. But we we do have a recording. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll post uh, the video on the Franklin Research Center's website so you can share with family and uh, other descendants of Bradensville as well who weren't able to make it today. I uh, wanna thank the audience for attending. Uh, the next uh, speaker event will be taking place on Tuesday, November the 9th at one o'clock and will feature Dr. Eric McDuffie of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign um, and uh, again, thank you all for your attendance and for sharing with us this afternoon. Go ahead. Before you leave, can can we make everybody visible? Is that possible? Uh, I, don't I don't know if it's too much to, to do. And I, if you could keep Let it, see. I didn't get a chance to read the chat. I see some messages in here. I would like to read the chat.